Um, uh, I think probably most of you know one or both of us. Uh, I'm Kyle, this is Adam, we're the Bayoutcast, with this admins here. Um, and just kind of go over kind of a quick primer for those of you who don't know what Bayoutcast is, and maybe some information about it you didn't know. Uh, there's been some confusion lately. It sounds like some people seem to think that, you know, it's kind of the Wild West. It's kind of maybe you build your own, no support, that kind of thing. So here to clarify some of that and uh, and kind of give you some information about what Bayoutcast is and how it might help you out. Uh, first things first, high performance computing in general, or HPC is what we call it. And and what is that? Uh, it's really a whole bunch of computers working together as one large computer, or in some cases, you know, we'll have clusters of this, uh, these 24 machines will work on one project, and these 10 will work on another, and these other ones will be working on individual ones, or maybe even several jobs a piece, that kind of thing. Uh, it, they're made to run. We're using a, a protocol called MPI, which is letting us talk between machines as well as in, inside machines to uh, to uh, run things parallel versus serial. Uh, one thing we emphasize is that if you, especially if you're running serial codes, if your software isn't specifically designed to take care of more than one core, running on HPC won't make your code run faster. Um, now, that doesn't mean that it's still no good because if your serial code is running for three weeks on your laptop and you can't use it for three weeks, you still might want to offload it, offload it somewhere else. We're still good in those cases, but that's not what our focus is, but we, we still have some, uh, some use even there. But just so you know, you know, you run it over on a, on a big machine doesn't necessarily mean it's going to run faster. 95% uh, or so run uh, Linux, uh, ours runs Linux, and, and that's as opposed to Unix and FreeBSD and some of those other strange things. We uh, nobody runs Windows. Uh, Microsoft tried an HPC initiative uh, ten-ish years ago, and it pretty well flopped. So nobody's really doing HPC on anything besides Unix-like platforms. Uh, a supercomputer in the top five hundred is running Linux. Uh, no, there's like three of them that aren't. I think okay. there's two of them that are running BSD, and one of them's running a proprietary Unix. Okay. If I remember right. So it's pretty close. Um, as with any scarce resource, we have to have an equitable way of assigning you know, resources to people, and we have it through a scheduler. So, as opposed to your desktop, where you tell it to, I want to, I want to start working on this prop problem. You submit it to a scheduler. It says I can fit you in at this date, this time, and lets it run then. And it constantly going through recalculations as. Uh, People with higher priority come in, they kick you back a little bit as machines die, as jobs get done early, earlier than they expected, things like that. So it's always doing these recomputations so they can get make the most efficient use of the resources that we have. And it is research grade. Uh, I like to claim that we have a solid 95 as an uptime. We really do shoot for about 95% of time, but you know, we we are not shooting for the super uptime like you want in central IT. We don't have all the redundancy built in, and I appreciate the job that they do because I like getting my check every other Friday. And so, but we're not that. We, we are not trying to be super duper reliable. We spend our money on making go as fast as we can while we can. So that's kind of the difference between to us and what you might think of as your typical IT stuff. Uh, some little statistics here, uh, just from where we are as of right now, and this is if everything is up and going, which it very rarely is all of it going up and going at once because when you're running this many machines, things happen, and especially when they start getting old, we have some that are five, six, even seven years old now at this point. I think. Anyway, we have uh, 339 nodes, constitutes a little over 200 cores in there. Uh, RAM, 43 terabytes of RAM. Among those, uh, that's really kind of K-State's niche when you when you compare us to our peer institutions. Uh, the number of cores we have, and the number of nodes we have, is a little bit lower than some of those. But the number kind of RAM we have is, is higher. Uh, that's just due to the nature of the problems that we we tend to be solving right now. The biggest drivers of that tend to be chemistry and DNA sequencing through plant pathology and some other places that do, are doing DNA type things. Uh, we have. A little over three petabytes raw disk space in our main cluster. We have another half petabyte or more in, in a secondary cluster. Um, that's raw space. We do, you know, I say we're 
research grade doesn't mean we have no redundancy. We are running, you know, normal replication and that kind of thing. So as, as one of our 500 disks goes out and we're not losing everything, which makes sense. Uh, we do have 102 GPUs that constitutes uh, about 370,000 CUDA quarters in there. Uh, that's, we are running uh, desktop quality GPUs in our stuff, uh, just because our single precision uh, floating point prop uh, is about equivalent as the big, bigger machines that cost 10 times as much, and most of our codes run single precision. So for what we, we need to do, that works out pretty well. Our biggest nodes that we have, uh, this one's actually, this is, this is the oldest one I'm talking about. I think it's about almost seven years old, six, seven, somewhere in there. Uh, it's got 80 cores and a terabyte of RAM. I like pulling this up uh, when people have not seen machines being used in an HPC environment before. I'll pull up one of those machines and show them HTOP on it, because you'll see 80 cores running flat out 100% CPU utilization almost all the time. And it's kind of impressive to see that many just like pay. Uh, and it has a terabyte of RAM. So that, so if, even though it's older and the CPU is a little older on that one, uh, it, has, it has plenty of RAM, so that makes it useful. We do have a couple of machines that have 32 Skylake cores of the newest ones and uh, a terabyte and a half of RAM and some GPUs in there too. So we have a, we don't have a lot, a lot in that range because those are obviously really expensive machines when you start throwing that much RAM in a box. Uh, but we do have those. The, we, that's the big end, the small end. We have several of these, these uh, 16 Sandy Bridge cores with 64 gigs of RAM and with even smaller RAM, 20 Broadwell those are the previous generation uh, with 32 gigs of RAM. So still fairly decent sized even on the, even on the smaller end, but uh, pretty impressive when you get to the bigger end of the machines. Uh, we're funded. Everything is supported by grants with the exception of a couple of uh, socially funded uh, Salary lines, including mine, which I appreciate. Thanks, guys. Um, everything else is, is provided for by our by our supporters. So this is people buying machines for us, and I'll talk about that in just a second. It is free for use for any researcher in the state and their collaborators. And yes, that really means free. Anybody here on campus, if you have some computing time, needs to be used. You can sign up, and you can use it for free. Now. If you're running on the free tier, you also get pushed to the back of the line. So that's the that's the trick. Is that you know sometimes, if, especially if you're running small jobs, a lot, a lot of times you can even run just as well as you would if you own a node. But so what we do is we have people buy us machines, and the deal with that is that then this, if you buy a machine, you have priority access on that machine. So if anybody outside of your working group is on that machine and you need to use it, it kicks them off. That'd be the free people in the free tier. It kicks them off, and then you, you get priority access on it. Typical work cycle of a research machine is people will work on it really heavily for somewhere from one to three months, and then they'll sit doing nothing for another one to three months. Sometimes that process is faster, sometimes it's slower, but that's fairly typical for, for a research, a particular researcher. So they'll have it. Really, their machines will be really busy for a while, and then they'll go idle and they won't be using it for a while, whether while they're doing their own analysis and that kind of things or offline work. And that's when the people on the free tier can jump on there and use their machines for, for free. So that's how that, that's kind of how we fund this whole thing and how we can make it free for any research in the state. And it is researcher in the state. We do have people from other universities, uh, Concordia, Fort Hayes. Uh, Benedictine even has one. And one of my personal points of pride is that we've had a couple people from KU Med Center and used our machine because it's easier to get a down on our machine than it was to get on a used machine. <laughs> um, our supporters tend to be people who have run their own clusters in the past. Uh, you guys are IT pros, so you probably understand this pretty well, but people find out that the expensive part about running a machine is not buying the hardware. It's keeping the security patches, it's keeping uh, software updated, and all this kind of thing. You don't want turnover, so people you know, we'd buy a cluster in the past and you know, be a six node cluster or something small like that. And they'd have it put a grad student on it. And then the grad student graduate and six months later say, I can't log in anymore. What do I do? And they don't know. So those tend to be our biggest supporters or people who have uh, had their own clusters in the past. Uh, and more recently, 
Central has been pushing people toward us whenever people talking about you know buying with startup funds that kind of thing. So we have a wider variety now than we did when I started here six years ago. Why this matter to you? Okay, we support your researchers. Uh, we do have two full-time system administrators. Uh, we have a full-time application scientist. We call him our user optimizer. Sometimes he optimizes code, sometimes he just optimizes the users. And that really gets into some of the, uh, the finer points of, of using the system as effectively as possible. And he is, he is there full-time. It's not unusual to come by in the afternoon and he'll be sitting down with somebody I've never met before, uh, either rewriting code or figuring out the best way and he'll you know, figure out how to best scale it where you know, it scales really well up to one machine but not on multiples or this scales really well to eight machines. But once you put the ninth on there, the performance really slows down. He's really good about that. Uh, we do have another uh, person on staff. He's working specifically with the CNAP project. That was a... Uh, 10 million dollar grant, is that right? Like that. Eight million dollar grant, something like that, that was announced last year through the psychology department, I believe. Anyway, that, they're kind of separate. They kind of work with us, but not really, but we do have somebody actually working full time on that. Why that matters to you? Because we are a free resource that you should be aware of. Um, we, we are here to help you guys out. You know, I mean, as far as the research side of things, we don't do anything on the academic side of the house. We don't do anything on the production side of the house. But on the research side, we can help you out. And hey, we can offload some of your work. Isn't that a good thing? Uh, we, we want to be there. We, we are in a good spot to be helping those people out, whereas you might have limited knowledge in that particular area. So especially when it comes to Linux and that type of thing, people who don't work with Linux tend to know nothing about it. And people who work with it tend to know a lot about it. So there's, we can help you out with that. Uh, my boss, Dan Andreessen, also teaches a class every fall. It's a CS625. It's a parallel computing something, parallel programming. That's we call it parallel, parallel programming. Actually, we usually call it 625 because computer guys and we do that. Um, but anyway, he always is constantly putting out uh, calls for people who need better code. So this is a student. Pro they all, all the students in that class have a project that they have to do where they're optimizing code. And they're optimizing the best way. So we had somebody actually got an A in the classes last year by reading documentation. <laughs> Seriously, it was like, it was like, okay, we're gonna have to rewrite this and make it better. And they went to the documentation. Oh, it already does that. We just need to invoke it the right way. They got off really easy, but sometimes that's what it takes. You, you know, it's a matter of understanding what's going on. The people running it didn't understand what was going on, and they got a significant speed up from from reading the documentation and using it correctly. And that's okay. Uh, and but so if you have even just like one or two people that are you know need stuff going faster, that is a resource that you can use. Uh, here's some examples. Uh, we decided not to put names on here, so especially since we're recording this and we're gonna put this on our YouTube channel and don't want to call anybody else, that kind of thing. Um, but we had somebody in the statistics department, they were using R, and they had jobs that were running in the two to three week range, and they were running a couple hundred thousand of them in that two to three week range, and it was taking a while. Uh, Dave, our application scientist, the, the user optimization guy, he rewrote it in C, and that gave a 10 times speed up. And then he parallelized it some in C, and that gave another five times speed up. So you end up with a 50 times speed up. So now instead of running in two to three weeks, it was running in a couple of hours. That makes a huge difference when your researchers are getting things done, and when they can start doing that, especially when you're talking that volume of jobs they're doing. Uh, one of my favorite stories, uh, this was like one of those 625 projects I was just talking about, student worked on that one. Uh, you can see the number there, it's pretty impressive. Uh, we had a researcher come to us from VetMed saying, we have things going, but and it's working, but it's really slow. Now, usually when we hear things really slow, we typically think of something in the you know weeks, maybe a couple weeks, maybe a month kind of range. And so uh, Dan, my boss, goes to her and says, "Okay, well, so how long is it? How long is it taking you now?" Says, well, from what it's done so far, and how many we have to go, we think it's going to take about 150 years. <laughs> Obviously, that's not tenable. So he threw this at a, at a student group, 
and they got an 18 million time speed up. It got it down to a few minutes from something that was supposed to take up the hours, just from being inefficient in the way it was, it was being coded and, and, and taking over some of those kinds of things. We have some non-conventional things we've done too. Because we have a lot of hardware out there, uh, we worked with Econ here this last year. They had a Windows MATLAB server in their office and their own server was dying. And they were wanting to move things to Converge infrastructure. And the problem is they needed several quarters and 64 gigs of RAM. And Central came to us saying, we don't have any, any machines that have 64 gigs of RAM that we, or gigs of RAM that we can throw at this. And so I said, so we worked with, with Central and with the group. We, we created a virtual machine, a Windows machine that they are actually running all the security updates and that kind of thing. So we don't have to go outside of our expertise. We have Central doing that, but we're throwing the hardware at it because that research grade is, is good enough for, for what they were working on there. And we can throw a lot of hardware at it really quick. And so we can uh, make, make them happy, uh, kept IT happy, Central IT happy because they weren't having to use a lot of their resources on something that was being used in a research and, and non critical role like that. Uh, mechanical engineering. We had somebody, this was what, six months ago maybe? Yeah, six yeah. months ago. That, uh, their job kept using more and more RAM as they were trying to do it. Uh, we had somebody working on it and figured out where, where things were going on, did some reprogramming, and got that down from running over 75 gigs per job to down to less than one gig. It, it, was, a, it was a MATLAB application. They, they had actually compiled it down to a binary that you could send to a cluster. We do allow MATLAB. Um, and we think that the MATLAB garbage collection was not collecting fast enough. And so it would easily hit 75 to 150, somewhere in there, gigs of memory. And he just rewrote that in C. And it runs in less time and way, way, way less memory. Another one, this, this just happened this week. So this is brand new and uh, we had a PhD student in, uh, in physics that uh, had a Python program and Adam sat down with him, was it just yesterday? Yeah, two days ago. Two days ago. Okay. Um, this, these jobs were running, again, looking like it was going to take several weeks. And by figuring out how this thing was, was running and how we could optimize it, he got that finished at the afternoon that he came in to visit with us after using a significant portion of our cluster resources for a couple of weeks, sat down with us and got that down to a very short time period. He was done that afternoon. So, so we do work with people, you know, we have on the programming end, on the use end, that kind of thing. Those are what we really do well at in, in, in the side of things. Uh, other resources that we can help with, we have a MATLAB compilation license. I know MATLAB is a big thing across campus. We can't run MATLAB, we actually, we can run MATLAB directly on our cluster, but we don't provide any license. So you have to provide your own license server and people don't tend to like that because they don't know when the job's gonna start so they don't know when to be off of their own license, that kind of thing. Uh, but we do have a MATLAB comp compiler license. So it'll actually take MATLAB and create C. This is a this is a MathWorks project. This is not anything we've done. This is this is them. They have this, and so you compile it one time, and then you can submit that job without without actually running MATLAB. You're just running their C code onto our cluster. So that's one thing we do. Uh, we have Exceed resources. That is, if things get too big for even us, uh, we've only had it happen a couple of times. But you have people that want need a whole lot of processing power. We have contacts around the nation. Exceed is a national resource running on uh, computers in, uh, in Pittsburgh and San Diego and Austin, Texas, you know, some of the bigger supercomputers that in, in the world, actually, and help, help us get on those jobs out to there if we, if we need to get to that point. On the other end of that, we have Open Science Grid. Open Science Grid is for high throughput computing, where you might have a smaller job, doesn't require a lot of resources, but you're doing it millions of times, potentially, or hundreds of thousands of times. So you're doing you know, Monte Carlo simulations, those types of things that, uh, you know, they don't take a lot of resources individually, but together they can be a lot. So we are a member of Open Science Grid. You can submit your jobs out there, uh, and it'll be distributed nationwide. So you might have, you know, a couple jobs run here at K-State. You might have some in Nebraska. You might have some in Chicago. You might have some elsewhere. But instead of running all on one spot, it's distributed nationwide, and, and we can help you get onto that. And this is new, actually, just this week, we actually got it running. 
Uh, GPN is the Great Plains Network. That is a consortium of states in this area, uh, us, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri. Minnesota. What's that? Minnesota. Minnesota. Uh, yeah, South Dakota, North Dakota. Yeah, kind of the Midwest region. Uh, that's, a, that's a group of states that are, that are working together on a bunch of projects. And we now have a Kubernetes cluster distributed there too. So we need some Docker and uh, containerized stuff. That's, we have ways we can go there. Like I said, that's very highly experimental right now. But if you have something that fits in that project space, let us know. We'd like to help you out with that. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Any 